It is a great joy to be here, finally. But uh, we, I, I love Lancaster Baptist Church. Brother Chapel has become a dear friend of mine. I'm very thankful for the ministry, not just here, but all around the world. What an encouragement uh, he's been and this church has been to preachers. And I, I just hope that you never take for granted what we have. God has been so good to us. Uh, I, I didn't have the privilege to grow up in a Christian home. I never went to church, not even one time, until I went to college to prepare for the ministry. But I got saved because a Baptist preacher invited me to go with his church to youth camp. And uh, I didn't know what camp was. It was summer. I was kind of bored. And he said, uh, why don't you come to camp? I said, why? What are we going to do? He said, well, we'll climb the mountains. We'll uh, ride uh, inner tubes down the whitewater rapids. And we might even hike up to a bear cave. And the bear might still be there. I've never seen a bear before in real life, so I got my best friend. I said, hey, you want to go to camp? He said, why? I said, we're going bear hunting. <laughs> and so we got to camp, and it was just like he said, beautiful mountains and river, and it was great. But uh, as soon as we got there, we set up the, the, the tents, and while we're setting up the tents, the ladies cooked a meal over the campfire. And it was wonderful, but right after the service... The preacher and some of the men started lining up the picnic tables in a long, straight row. And I, I asked the guy, I said, what's going on with the tables? He said, we're getting ready for our service. Service? What service? He said, we're going to have a preaching service. I said, it's Monday. He said, we're going to have preaching every night. And I got worried. I thought, oh, man, I've read about these cults that kidnap you, take you to the wilderness brainwashing and next thing you know you're wearing pajamas at the airport <laughs> so i just came for the bear hunt how about if i just wait in my tent while y'all have whatever this thing is he goes no no you have to come great great he said i want all the girls on this side of the table and all the guys on that side of the table and i thought well if i have to come i'm going to make it worth my while so i scouted out the prettiest girl in the whole camp and waited for her to sit down. And when she sat down, I sat across from her. And I thought, you know, it'd probably be boring for the next hour or so, but I've got somebody to look at, so it'll be all right. Well, they sang a few songs, gave some announcements, and then he began to preach. I'd never heard preaching before, never heard a sermon before in my life. But I'm telling you what, this guy... As they say down south, he could shuck the corn. He was hollering and yelling and wandering and waving. And every time he came by the table, he'd pound and spit and snort, veins sticking out on his neck, eyes bulging, and spit was flying everywhere. And, and I just sat there going, whoa. I leaned over to my friend. I said, man, that's better than TV. Well, he, he preached a while, and then he said, everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. I thought, I'm not closing my eyes. I want to see the whole show. And so uh, they gave an invitation. I've never seen an invitation, but he said, if, if you need to get saved, raise your hand. Well, of course, I'm peeking, and a, a couple of kids raised their hand. And they sang a song, and those kids that raised their hand came forward, and the counselors took them into the woods. Well, I got nervous. I asked him later, I said, hey, what happened to these guys who went to the woods? And the guy said, well, they got saved. And he asked me, he said, you ever been saved? Well, I figured out by now, this is a Baptist crowd and Baptist saves a good thing. So I said, what, me? Yes, of course, lots of times. Well, I had no idea, but I had a better attitude about the service. And so I, I came and I waited for that girl to sit down the next night. When she sat down, I sat across from her. But evidently, I wasn't the only one that didn't have a Bible because they had Bibles on the table. And he said, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. And uh, she grabbed one of those Bibles and flipped the pages open and handed it to me. I said, uh, thank you. I'm thinking, what a great camp the second day, and she likes me. <laughs> well, obviously, when the prettiest girl at camp hands you the Bible, you're going to read it. And so I followed along as the preacher read, and he read the story in Luke 16 that Jesus told about the rich man that died and went to hell. 
I didn't know there was a real place called hell. I knew it was a bad word. But he began to tell us how wonderful heaven is. And if you get saved when you die, you can go to heaven. And then he began to tell us about hell. He talked about the fact that if you're not saved when you die, you'll go to hell. And you'll, he talked about the fire and the torment and the suffering and the agony. And while he's preaching, God got hold of my heart. He said, if you don't want to go to hell, you need to get saved. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what saved is, but I don't want to go to hell. So that's what I need. And he gave the invitation. He said, if you'd like to get saved, would you raise your hand? I wanted to get saved. I really did. But I didn't raise my hand. I didn't want that girl to know I wasn't already saved. And I was with my friend. I didn't want him to think I was a wimp. And so even though I, I, I was under conviction, I didn't know that word then, but I was under conviction. I knew I needed to get saved. I wanted to get saved, but I didn't do it. That night when it's time to go to sleep, I'm lying in my tent and I'm tossing and turning and I'm thinking, why didn't I get saved? About that time, a storm rolled in over the mountains, thunder and lightning and wind. That never bothered me before. I mean, I'm 13, 13 year old boys are tough. But I got to thinking, what if lightning hits a tree, falls on my tent and squishes me? I'm dead. I'm in hell. I missed my chance. I didn't know you get saved anytime, anywhere. I thought you had to raise your hand at the end of a preaching service. And so I, I didn't know how to pray, but I made a deal with God. I said, if you don't let me die tonight, I'll get saved tomorrow, I promise. Well, service came that night. I sat in the same place, but I really didn't look at her or think about her much. Didn't listen to him at all. I just kept thinking, would you hurry up and get done? I gotta get saved. He gave the invitation. He said, if you need to get saved, would you raise your hand? My hand went straight up. I didn't care what she thought. I didn't care what my friend thought. He said, he said uh, I'm going to pray for you. My prayer won't save you, but I'll pray you have the courage. Come talk to me or one of our counselors so we can show you what God says. As soon as that invitation started, I jumped out. I went right to the preacher. I'm not taking a chance with the counselor. I, I went right to the preacher. He said, what are you coming for? I said, I need to get saved. He opened the Bible and explained that I was a sinner deserving of hell and told me about how God loved me and sent his son to die for my sins. And salvation's a free gift. And if I just pray and ask him to save me, he'd do it. He said, would you like to pray right now? I was a little embarrassed. I said, I don't know how to pray. He said, I'll help you. He said, if you mean the words, repeat them after me. And he led me through the sinner's prayer. And that night I got saved. You know, over the years, that was a long time ago. Uh, see, I was 13, so that'd be what, like 23, 24 years ago now. But <laughs> over the years, I've thought, thank God I didn't die that first night. Thank God I had another chance. That's what I want to preach to you about this morning, is the God of another chance. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. We know the story of Jonah. The scoffers laugh at the story. The unbelievers deny it, but if God said it, I believe it. I like what the, the old preacher said. He said, I believe the Bible's the word of God. If the Lord would have said that Jonah swallowed a whale, I would believe it. If you're able to stand, stand with me, and I want to start reading in the very first verse of Jonah chapter 1. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, bless the preaching this morning. I don't know the needs. I don't know the situations. I don't know the hearts, but you do. God, you not only know, but you care. And so I pray that the message might be an encouragement. I pray that it might be a challenge. And Lord, I pray that in some cases it might be an awakening folks to realize that there is another chance with you. Father, bless the message and bless the invitation we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. It's a familiar story. Jonah is a preacher. 
He's a man of God. He's a prophet. The Lord has ordained him and anointed him. And one day God said, I have a job for you, Jonah. I want you to go to Nineveh. At that time, Nineveh was the largest city in all the world, capital of the Assyrian Empire. And God said, in 40 days, I'm going to destroy the city. I want you to go preach. I don't know the reason. I've heard speculation by numerous preachers. But for whatever reason, Jonah said, I'm not going to Nineveh. I don't care if it's four days or four hours. I, I'm not going to Nineveh. And what we just read says that he rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now think about that. Where are you going to go to hide from God? But he rose up to flee. Nineveh's this way. He went this way. Got on board ship. Went down into the lower parts of the ship. And he fell asleep. And God sent a storm. The purpose of the storm was to get Jonah's attention. By the way, if there's something God wants you to do and you're completely disobedient about it, mark it down, God will get your attention. And that storm was unlike other storms. I can tell by the reaction of the sailors. That ship began to be tossed in those waves as the wind and the waves beat against that ship. The, the sailors became concerned. They thought, we're going to drown, we're going to die. Those waves will smash our ship into pieces of wood, uh, we'll perish. And so they began to throw their cargo overboard. In fact, it got so bad that they got religious. They began to pray. And they beseeched whatever deity that they might have served, uh, that they might be spared and have mercy. And somebody thought about Jonah. And they ran downstairs and they grabbed him. They shook him and said, hey, hey, there's a terrible storm. Somebody has upset God. And Jonah said, oh, yeah, that'd be me. I said, what are you talking about? Well, God wanted me to go to Nineveh, but I don't want to go. And so... I imagine he sent this storm for me. And they said, well, what are we going to do? If I'm Jonah, and I know that there's a deadly storm that, that is an obvious hand of God's chastisement, I think, I hope I would say, turn the boat around and I'll obey God. But that's not what Jonah said. Jonah said, well, I guess you just throw me overboard. Do you ever think about that? Jonah said, throw me overboard. Now, you and I, we know the story of Jonah and the whale, right? Jonah didn't know that story. Here's what Jonah's saying. Jonah's saying, I'd rather die, I'd rather drown than obey God. Just throw me overboard. You know, when you get away from God, you make some really foolish choices. Well, they didn't want to. They tried everything they could, but eventually they had no choice and threw him overboard. The Bible says God created a great fish. Jesus called it a whale, and you know the story, swallowed Jonah. And for three days and three nights, Jonah is in the belly of the whale. In chapter 2, the Bible tells us, Jonah says, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. It took three days and three nights in the most undesirable circumstances that you can imagine. And finally, Jonah woke up. He said, I'll pay that I vowed. God, I'll do what you want me to do. And the Lord directed the fish to go to, toward the land. And that fish spit Jonah out on dry ground. Can you imagine how that guy smelled? It'd be like spending three days in a sardine can. But if you still have your Bibles open, look at chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. The second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. 
What a wonderful opportunity. Here is a rebel running from God, causing great harm all around him. And now when he finally gets right with the Lord, when he says, you were right, I was wrong. I remember you. I'll pay the vows. God said, so go do what I ask you to do. And Jonah did. He went to Nineveh. What a sermon he preached. Yep, 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. But God used that message from the prophet to get hold of the king's heart. And the king said, we are wicked and ungodly. We need to turn to the Lord. And he commanded a citywide fast, not just the adults, not just the adults and the children, but even all the animals were supposed to fast. And the king said, who knows if God will change his mind? Who knows if the Lord will spare Nineveh? And we know the story. God did spare Nineveh. But it was because the man of God got a second chance. You know, every now and then I come across somebody who says, you know, I used to live for God, but I made some foolish choices. And now my life is a wreck. Now I've made some... I've, I've, made the kind of bed that I just am doomed and destined to lie in. I want to tell you this morning, God is a God of the second chance. There's none of us that are without sin, but the Bible tells us that if we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I know that because I read about a guy in, uh, in the Old Testament whose name was David. You remember David, he's the one who killed the giant Goliath. He's the one that God had anointed to be the king of Israel. He's the one who God used to write most of the Psalms that bless and encourage our hearts. He's the one that the Lord called a man after God's own heart. The Lord raised up David to be a great, great king. And he was for a long, long time. But one day when the armies went off to battle, David stayed home. I don't know why he stayed home. I don't know if he was tired. I don't know if he figured his leadership, could, uh, those in leadership could take care of it. But I do know that it was the time when kings went forth to battle and he didn't go. And you know the story. One night he walked out on his rooftop and across the way he saw Bathsheba and he lusted after her and he said who is that and somebody said well that's Bathsheba she's the wife of one of your soldiers and as the wheels in David's mind turned he considered well he's off fighting the battle and she's home and so he sent for her and committed immorality and thought, nobody knows. Well, not long afterwards, she comes to him and says, we got troubles. My husband's off in war and I'm expecting. And David said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. He sent for Uriah to come home. Uriah said, I'm not going to my house while my fellow soldiers are out uh, shedding their blood and giving their lives in the battle. I'm not going home as long as the battle needs to be fought. And so David writes a letter to his general and says, Joab, put Uriah at the front of the battle and have everybody else retire from him. Well, obviously, he's left alone to face the enemy. He was killed. And David said, yeah, that's a terrible thing. That happens in war, but now we can get married. So David married Bathsheba, and in his mind, nobody knows. But God knows. And so God told Nathan the prophet, and Nathan comes to David and says, uh, we got a problem in the kingdom. David said, what is it? He said, well, you have a very wealthy man with herds, flocks, and you have a very poor man who lives next to him who has one sheep. That sheep is just beloved by him. Well, the rich man had company, and instead of slaughtering one of his livestock, he slaughtered the, the neighbor's lamb, and David was incensed. He said, that man ought to die. 
Who was it? And Nathan pointed at his face and said, You, you, thou art the man. And immediately David's heart is stricken. You say, how do you know that? Because the 51st Psalm, as David cries out in repentance and anguish and sorrow, he says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. And we go on through the rest of the psalm as David cries out to God. Finally, he's not worried about covering his sin. Finally, he's not worried about getting away with something maybe nobody else knows. Now he's at the place where he recognizes, God, I've sinned against you. I've disobeyed you. I've dishonored you. I've, I've lived a terrible and wicked life. But God, I want to be made right. He says, wash me thoroughly. I should be clean. He said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Well, there's a verse in Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18, that says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to give you license to go out and do wrong. But what I am telling you is if you've messed up, there's still hope. If you've done wrong, there's still forgiveness. If you've sinned against God, He still is waiting to restore you and waiting to bless you and waiting to use you. Don't use your past life as an excuse. Don't use your life as a reason not to serve God. I was out door knocking and a lady answered the door and I witness to her and invited her to church and she said you wouldn't want me at your church i said why is that and she said well you don't know the kind of life that i lived you don't know the things that i've done you would be embarrassed to have me at your church i said well we we have kind of a requirement the only people we want at our church are those that jesus loves and her eyes welled up in tears, and she said, does Jesus love me? I said, he sure does. And she came that Sunday and the next Sunday and got saved. That's an, I'm not trying to minimize what you've done. I'm just trying to encourage you that we serve a God of the second chance. We serve a God. How many times have people said to me, you know, when I was young, I thought maybe God wanted me to do this for him, but now it's too late. I thought maybe God was calling me to do this, but I didn't obey, and now it's too late. Listen, if you can still draw breath into your lungs, it's not too late. If you're still here, you're still here for a reason. I love the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15. A man had two sons, and the younger one came and said, Dad, uh, I want my inheritance now. Kind of morbid if you think about it. Inheritance is what you get when Dad dies. But the son said, I want my inheritance now. And he, Dad, for whatever reason, gave him his inheritance, and the son went into a far country, and there he wasted all that he had with riotous living. Famine came into the land. He's broke. He has no friends. And now he's got to find a job. And he fain, the Bible says, would fill his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. I mean, taking care of the pigs is a pretty bad job for a Jewish young man. I don't know how long he was in that pig pen. I don't know how long he had to slop the hogs. I don't know how long he had to try and eat their leftovers. But the Bible tells us in verse 17, when he came to himself, he woke up. He realized, this isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I planned. This isn't what I hoped for. This isn't what I desired. He said, my father's servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. And then he realized what he had to do. He said, I'm going to go home. And I'll say to my father, Father, 
I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And so he got up out of that pig pen, probably smelling a lot like Jonah smelled. And he made his way home. I can remember as a kid, whenever I wanted something from my parents, I would rehearse my saying in my mind, make sure to get the words just right. And he's walking down the road, going over this, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the Bible says that when he was a great way off, his father saw him. In order for dad to see him, he probably had to be looking for him. I don't think it was a casual glance. I can imagine that every day dad went out and looked down that road hoping that this would be the day that his son comes home. But one day he's been disappointed so many times he's wondering, is that him? I think it's him. I'm not sure it's him, but when he got close enough and he realized that it was, the Bible says that his father had ran and had compassion on him and fell on his neck. And so dad runs and grabs him and hugs him. And while he's hugging him, the boy's trying to recite his little speech. Uh, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And dad says, shh, shh, shh. Go get some new clothes for this boy. Let's have a, uh, let's kill the fatted calf. This, let, let, let's celebrate because my son who is lost is found. He was dead and he's alive again. And the son recognized he got another chance. I think sometimes when people get away from the Lord, they're embarrassed to come back. They know that they did wrong and they'd like to have that relationship restored, but it's just a matter of awkwardness, embarrassment, or maybe even pride that keeps them away. Oh, thank God for this story that the father was waiting and wanting and willing and ran, embraced his son, and made that son know that he had another chance. Folks, I'm trying to tell you this morning, God gives another chance. You haven't gone far enough but what you can't get back. You haven't sinned egregiously enough that you can't be forgiven. You haven't uh, uh, done so much wrong that it can't all be taken care of. The Bible is very clear that God is a God of the second chance. One last story. Remember Peter? It's the Lord's su the Last Supper right before Jesus went to be crucified. The Lord said, this night, every one of you is going to deny me. And Peter said, not me. The rest of these guys might. I mean, I, I haven't trusted most of them anyway. There's John. He's always cozying up to you. And Judas carries a purse. That ought to tell you something. And, and uh, he said, Lord, these guys might deny you, but I sure won't. I never will. <laughs> Lord, I'm the guy that walked with you on the water. Remember that? I'm the guy up on the mount wanting to build tabernacles for you and Moses and Elijah. Lord, I'll die before I deny you. There's a verse in the Bible that said, pride go before destruction, haughty spirit before a fall. They came, arrested Jesus, took him to be tried, and somebody came up to Peter and said, hey, weren't you one of them? I don't know him. Another said, you have the same accent as, as him. Aren't you one of them? No, not me. And the third time when they asked him, he denied it with a curse. And in the background, Peter heard the rooster crow just as Jesus had promised. And Peter went out and wept bitterly knowing that he had denied his Lord. Jesus was died, was buried, and he rose again. Peter's ready to quit the ministry. He said, I'm going back to fishing. But while they were fishing, they see somebody on the shore. And somebody figured out it's the Lord. And Peter jumps out of the boat and as fast as he can, goes to him. But before he can even speak, Jesus said, Peter, lovest thou me? 
That's a good question to ask after he just denied him. Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And he asked him again. He said, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you, you know that I love you. And he asked him again, do you love me? And Peter, with a broken heart, said, Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And three times the Lord said to him, Either feed my lamb or feed my sheep. What he's trying to say is, Peter, I can still use you. I'm not finished with you. There's still things that you can do and ways that you can be a blessing. And I don't know what the whole situation was there, but I do know this. Peter got right with God. Because a few days later, he stood up on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 got saved. And the Lord chose him to write two books in the New Testament. See, what I'm trying to tell you is any of us could go astray. And the promise of forgiveness, the promise of restoration is there for all of us. And a life restored is a life that's useful. But if we stay out of the will of God, if we use our old life, our past sins, our bad choices, our foolish decisions, if those become a reason not to serve God, they're as egregious as the sin that took you away from God. So remind yourself of Isaiah 118. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. Let me ask you this morning, do you need to come back to God? Do you need that second chance? If so, remember the Father waiting and watching for that wayward son to come home. The door is always open. He's already made the first step. Now it's your turn.